I'm Nathan Wells. I'm a software architect for adaptive computing. Um, I uh, have primary responsibility over our interfaces and data structures. So Moab Web Services is essentially my baby. Um, if you insult my baby, I will hunt you down and kill you. Um, no, not really. Actually, I, I really like to get uh, feedback, both positive and negative. So. Um, if you have some problem that you're experiencing um, with integrating with the Moab solution at all, uh, whether you're using Moab Web Services or not, that's my, that's my uh, responsibility. So uh, come talk to me about it, please, so I can get your feedback and integrate it. I'm going to introduce to you what Moab Web Services is. Uh, some of you may already know, but um, we're going to talk about what RESTful Web Services are. Um, we're going to talk about uh, integrating with Moab using Moab Web Services. Uh, and we're going to talk about the joint project that I and, and Ross Miller from uh, um, Oak Ridge, sorry, just totally blanked, um, Oak Ridge did uh, providing an uh, a API uh, that uses Moab Web Services to submit jobs. And uh, then we'll have some time for questions and, and uh, answers. Um, hopefully you're happy with the answers. Uh, so here's the deal. RESTful Web Services are great. Um, they use uh, the HTTP standard, and standards are awesome. Um, it's what's the, what the web is built on, so that means you get a whole lot of tools for free. You also get a whole lot of um, help in terms of uh, other people using the same types of APIs in a very anecdotal uh, sort of evidence for this. Uh, Amazon.com's REST API has 85% of users uh, for Amazon.com web services, uh, which is pretty significant. So 15% of the people are very sad because they have to use SOAP. Um, so we, uh, we chose REST because we feel like, like it's a very natural uh, approach to what we do. Um, it gives you the most uh, natural feel, we believe, in interacting with Moab. So um, REST is pretty, pretty straightforward. It's based on resources being hosted on a server. So that's the basic concept, and you can do a number of th things with those resources. Um, in our case, the server is Moab, and the resources are things like jobs, and nodes and reservations and, and all sorts of other things. So you basically use this API to do things to those resources. Uh, things like getting those resources, where you read in a list of them or get a single one. Um, things like updating those resources or modifying them. So let's say that you wanted to modify some particular part of a job, uh, maybe uh, it's start, requested start time or duration, that sort of thing that you just put. Uh, post uh, to create uh, uh, or submit a resource. So if you want to submit a job, you use post. Um, and delete, well, to delete. <laughs> so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's some confusion around put and post. Everybody seems to get hung up. Hopefully that uh, this helps. It's also helpful that post and put are usually mutually exclusive in terms of uh, what resource is supported and, and what you're talking about. So in order to do a put, you need to identify the exact resource you want to uh, work with. Uh, post, you can't because it's, you're creating a new one. So uh, that's basically the idea of RESTful Web Services. Now let's go through an example. Let's say that I have been asked to create a, an HPC portal where uh, jobs are submitted, and those need to end up in Moab some way. And uh, so basically what happens is I get some user input, hopefully in a form that's uh, understandable to users. Um, so they're providing input in their native language, whatever that is. Um, and they say, run a Monte Carlo simulation with this data. And you, of course, know what a Monte Carlo simulation is and how Moab understands that. So you have this little converter process that changes their user input into a Moab job. Um, so this would be in the form of probably a JSON document uh, with certain fields filled out. And then you do the work of, of posting that uh, to Moab 
uh, to Moab Web Services specifically. Um, and then that job would be read in by Web Services and then uh, Moab would do the work of scheduling it. So this is why uh, we do Moab Web Services. It shouldn't be so freaking hard to do stuff with Moab. Um, we, uh, the team of guys that work on Moab Web Services and the UI team, where I originally came from, um, we, we had pain every day because we had to interact with Moab in, in ways that were unnatural. For you admins in the, <laughs> for you admins in the field, <laughs> yes, really, really wrong. Um, <laughs> for you admins, it's natural for you to use the command line interface, right? That's, that's your native uh, operating environment is hacking at a command line, trying to um, you know, diagnose what's going wrong or administering Moab with configuration files. For integration developers and for those of you that are developing integrations with Moab, you know that the command line makes it really hard to do your job. Um, I mean, it, it's just hard to work with. So we decided we're gonna create RESTful web services for Moab. And um, that's, this is the answer. This is how it gets easier. Uh, I've already introduced West RESTful web services, but we also have this new uh, plugin API that we'll be using in Moab web services to allow you to integrate functionality, new functionality into uh, Moab so that uh, perhaps you want uh, some, some process to happen every time a job is submitted. Maybe you need to uh, uh, write that out to some data warehousing utility. Maybe you need to uh, report that into some um, IT system that uh, is managed by a totally separate IT department than what you're in. Um, there's any number of use cases for this. And we've made the interface generic enough that you should be able to handle a lot of that, but it should be in familiar terms for those who are used to working with Moab. Um, sorry, go ahead. How fine green is the access control model? OK. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more. So, uh, but I'll, we'll, there'll be plenty of time to answer all those questions uh, when we get to the end. So, um, what you see here on this slide is a, uh, a future uh, state that we want to be in. Uh, as we released with 7.0, this is kind of where we're at. Um, we want to be realistic about this. Uh, we don't want to try and sell you something that um, doesn't really exist. We've probably got, we want to eventually get to replacing or, or rather uh, replicating anything you can do with client commands. We're probably about 60% of the way there. Um, exactly, exactly. And a lot of that, uh, the natural stuff that uh, has been uh, easy to integrate into a RESTful API, we've already done. Like, you can get a list of jobs, which basically does what ShowQ does, essentially. Um, you can, um, you can uh, get an individual job, which is essentially what check job does, and that sort of thing. So um, there's a lot of depth, obviously, to Moab's command line interface, and uh, we want to get there, but we're not exactly there yet. If you have questions about individual parts that you would be interested in seeing, uh, talk to me after the presentation, and uh, we'll we'll get that uh, figured out whether it's already there or how quickly we can so do it. Step that's introduction now. Can you use this? Is there a Moab Web Services entity that is included that you can already use that's production capable? Yes. So we released Moab Web Services with uh, Moab 7.0. Um, it's integrated into the Moab package. It's not its own standalone thing like this. Oh, it, it is a, uh, so it's a, a Java web application. Um, so it is its own thing. Uh, we recommend actually that you run it on the same, uh, on the Moab head node um, for a number of reasons that may become immediately obvious to some of you who have large systems. Um, but uh, if you have any concerns about that, we can talk about it. Um, yeah, I think I've addressed everything on that slide. So let's talk about the PHP API that I worked on because uh, I like working on this sort of thing. Um, 
I, uh, let me say first though, PHP is not my favorite language. <laughs> I actually detest PHP um, for a number of reasons. Uh, but I hope that uh, I'm gonna show you some code so that you can see hopefully how easy it is to write an API against a RESTful web service. Um, basically, we were trying to solve a problem. Ross uh, came to me with uh, a concern that uh, there's no uh, end user based access control on web services. And that's probably a concern that a lot of you will have. Um, and so we decided that the best way is to write uh, a wrapper around web services to add uh, authentication and authorization uh, at that layer, uh, at a layer that has access to the operating system native uh, uh, identity controls. So, um, Let's see, yeah, so that's basically what we did. Um, I, uh, I worked on getting a job by ID, getting a jobs by user, and uh, uh, I never got to cancel, actually, but I uh, did submit, so that's, that should make up for it. Um, and so let's look at the source. Um, you should see. We'll make sure Ross has enough time. What uh... <laughs> Ross Ross is waving me on. <laughs> so um, let me bring this up. Uh... Bigger. Bigger. Is that better? One more time. There we go. Okay. All right. So basically, I create a function. Um, called get jobs uh, right there and there's even get job on the same screen that should show you right there how easy it is um, I created this helper function because curl in PHP is really hard to use uh, so I created a helper function that generates a, a curl environment for me to use and then I run this check user function uh, that passes in the username and the job and uh, if the, the user on the job is the same as the user that gets passed in, everything works fine. Otherwise, uh, an exception is thrown. Um, and uh, that's, that's basically it. That's all you have to do. Um, obviously, there's, there's much more richer ways to build an API. Uh, this works for me. It worked for our use case. And we didn't have to. Uh, you know, deal with some almost ornate sort of API that gets handed to us by, uh, you know, some, someone who thought they could do our job better than us. So that's, that's kind of what we want to do. We want to make sure that you get the base uh, of control uh, and uh, access that, that we get. And that's, so everything going forward that goes into to our UIs goes into web services. Anything you can do uh, with the command line going forward, we want to do with web services, or uh, allow you to do through web services as well. So, um, let's see. I don't think there's really anything else that's interesting. This is that check user function. Um, uh, that's not it. There it is. Okay. Um, so, finally, uh, I'll, again, there's some time for question and answer at the end, but we need feedback on this. Um, we're really prone to solve our own problems, and that's really easy for us to do because we know our own problems. So, but we want to solve your problems too, right? We're not here in this business to solve our own problems. We're here to solve your problems. So please give us feedback um, as you review the interface, as you start working with it. We want to hear your feedback. I didn't bring any cards today, but I will tomorrow, um, which will you know, give you a feedback, a way to give feedback straight to me. And I'm the one that's in control of the interface. So if you don't talk to me, it's your fault. <laughs> um, anyway, that's, that's basically it for me. Um, Ross Miller is up next. He's going to talk to us about uh, more specifics, more of the specifics of the Mantid integration um, and what it's being used for. Uh, so let's give it up for Ross. Yeah, great. 
shows up there. Good. Okay. Uh, my name is Ross Miller. I'm a software developer for Oak Ridge National Labs. Uh, this project that I got basically roped into um, was to use, and in fact, it w I should step back for a little bit. It was to basically allow an interface into a cluster for a bunch of scientists who are not computer geeks and don't want to know that they're using a cluster. Um, Moab Web Services wasn't actually a requirement that just that worked, so we grabbed, uh, you know, that's what we're using that one for. Um, so I'll start off with this. These scientists all work at what is called the Spallation Neutron Source, great big particle collider at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, we're very proud of it, and it's one of the, like I said, it's one of the most advanced lines in the, in, in the world. Um, and let's see, so there are I don't say there are 24 beam lines. It come everything comes out of a out of a uh, central source, and we've got room for 24. There are 14 separate experiments coming on that are online now, and they plan to have more later on. That's what we're talking about. Uh, the package that we that that uh, Nathan had mentioned is called Manted. This is the software that the scientists use for doing their neutron analysis. It's custom written. Uh, mostly by folks at Oak Ridge National Lab and also a uh, lab, uh, Rutherford Appleton Lab over in England, uh, who also have another similar neutron source. That is the interface that the scientists are used to using. That's the interface they like to use. Um, what you're looking at is a picture of this thing called Manted Plot. That's the GUI part of it. There is a separate uh, analysis framework that, uh, which is very convenient for us because I can run that on the cluster without having to run a GUI or anything. And the, um, it, it doesn't really show up too well here, but basically this is a whole list of various algorithms that the scientists are used to. They will chain together several of these to do their analysis on, the, uh, on their, their data sets. Here's the problem. The data sets range from about 10 megabytes, which is no big deal. You can do that, you can analyze that on your laptop, uh, up to hundreds of gigabytes. That's where it gets tricky. Uh, and of course, they're expecting the size to grow. If anybody has worked at any of the national labs, everybody is talking about scientific data sets keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, that's happening here too. For the types of analysis they're doing, it tends to be mostly memory bound for various and sundry reasons. They seem to have to load all of the entire data set into memory, or at least large chunks of it. They, haven't had a, they don't have a good way to just stream through a little bit at a time. Uh, the first solution when they first bumped into this was they just went out and bought three very large workstations, called up Dell, said give it, you know, fill up every dim slot with all the RAM you can. And on the one hand, well, that cost money, but that was a very easy solution. And call up Dell, give them money, they give you hardware, you keep on doing your work. That works, they're using those, those three workstations, but the, uh, what they bump into is they're, now they're having to schedule the scientists manually because they can only have one scientist on the workstation at a time. Otherwise, you're back to running out of memory again. Uh, and we're still back to those 100 gigabyte data sets. That's, they're still too big for a single workstation. So we're back to, eh, we need a cluster. Now, most of our users, they're physicists, uh, chemists, some biologists, no computer scientists. They're not, they're not computer geeks. They really don't want to have to learn a new interface. They know how to use Manted. They'd like to keep on using it, using the interface that they know. Um, you know, they really just don't want to have to know the details about running this on a cluster. The way they have been doing their work, they're already used to stringing together algorithms. So it was convenient for, for me and for my team that we could basically say, okay, we can take some of these algorithms when they will run on the cluster and all we need is an interface to it to basically launch jobs and check on you know, that the job has run. And again, we wanted to do that through the Manted Plot GUI. Don't want to have to have these scientists log in, 
write a bash script, queue sub, that sort of stuff. That's why we, uh, this is where Matched Web Services came in very handy for us. Now, as was sort of alluded to, the Matched Web Services deals only with a single user, and it's basically the admin user for the for this cluster that it's working on. If you read the docs on Matched Web Services, they talk about as part of the setup is set this username, set this password, and when you communicate with MWS, it's uh, you're using HTTP basic authentication. So it's you know uh, username colon password base 64 encode it and send it to MWS. That's all well and good if your web services app is under the under the control of your admin. So there's only you know if it's another uh, another web server or something like that. But Mantid Plot runs on individual workstations. We didn't want to be given out the admin password for our cluster to all the users. That just you know, I asked for permission to do that, and the admins you know basically cringed and said no, and you know. Go on, find find a better find some way other way to do it. So, what we came up with, and this is between Nathan and I, is to write some of this PHP code so that Mantid Plot will talk to uh, this PHP code that's running on Apache uh, and talk directly to that. Does the basic authentication again using the individual's username and password? not the, the Mantid Web Services one. Uh, in our case, Mantid, M, the server running MWS, the Tomcat, is actually hidden behind the firewall. You can't get to it. Um, now, that does lead to a little bit of a problem. Again, we have to do user authentication somehow. That part is not built into uh, Mantid Web Services. Fortunately, we happen to have an LDAP server handy. That's how we handled user accounts on that on the cluster anyway. Um, LDAP access and manipulation and whatnot is all built into PHP anyway, so it's only a few lines of PHP code. Basically the way it works, Mantid Plot sends a request over to our PHP code running on Apache. The PHP code is going to then contact the LDAP server and authenticate against the LDAP server and the, well, authentication and authorization. It will check to make sure you're a valid user, that you, you are who you say you are, and also that you've got an account on that cluster. Uh, at that point, assuming everything's okay, we, we get an okay back from the LDAP server, then we just forward that request straight on to Mantid Web Services. Um, the whole idea basically being that I'm not changing the, the interface uh, or the protocols or anything like that. This PHP code is really very much transparent. Um, you know, it's going to the same URLs as the, as the MWS REST interface. Uh, okay, and uh, of course, you know, replies from Mantid Web Services I'll have to get forwarded back to, you know, through the PHP code and then back to Mantid Plot. Uh, in order to you know, basically get the okay code that the job had been submitted or get the results of my, uh, of my get requests. There are a few security considerations, of course. We're using HTTP basic authentication, so you better use SSL in between everything um, or else you're sending passwords in the clear and you know, obviously that's bad. Um, same goes for LDAP. You've got to use the SSL-enabled version of LDAP. Um, in our case, Apache, where the PHP is running, and Tomcat, where Mantid Web Service is running, are in fact on the same server. Uh, we've got Tomcat set up to bind to localhost and even block the port over, uh, block the port on the firewall. So the only communication is on that server. And so I didn't bother with SSL there. Um, depending on how security paranoid you are, that might be a bad thing. But I figure if you've got access to the server to the point where you're intercepting those communications, uh, I've already lost. So <laughs> SSL isn't going to help me too much. Um, if they were on separate servers, of course, though, we'd want SSL there too. Um, 
As it is right now, I've got stuff set up for submitting jobs. We haven't released this to the public yet. Mantid itself is on its own release schedule, so that'll happen with the next Mantid release. Uh, the first thing I've got to, or bef before we do that, I do need two things in the near term that need to be done. That is obviously, um, an, uh, basically have a window pop up that shows you know, what jobs you've submitted and have they finished or not. And then we want to be able to automatic, automatically pull the results back into Mantid. Um, the whole point of this was that the, the scientists don't have to interact with the cluster. So if I have to make them log into the cluster and, and you know, SCP their results back to their workstation, uh, we kind of missed the point of all of this. So. <laughs>